morning. Welcome to Bridgehampton Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining us in our worship service. Our question today is, what sort of Messiah? Let me offer a prayer. God of compassion, whose love brings healing to lives that are broken. Speak words of life to us today, we pray. Amen. chapter 8 and verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked his disciples who do people say that I am and they answered him John the Baptist and, and others Elijah and still others one of the prophets. Hmm. He asked them what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone will become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? And those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends our scripture reading. 
What sort of Messiah? One day, Jesus and the disciples just walking down the road, and he asked them, Who do the people say that I am? And the disciples gave him some of the answers that were floating around. Oh, some say you're John the Baptist, others that you are Elijah, or one of the prophets come back to life. And Jesus then makes the question real up close and personal. What about you? Who do you say that I am? There was probably a moment of silence as they waited for each other to speak. And it's Peter, the bold one, who eventually responds, You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And Jesus replies, Well done! You're absolutely right. And the way Matthew's Gospel tells it, Matthew adds this was something God had revealed to Peter. But then comes an intriguing sting in the tail. Jesus says, you're right, but don't you dare tell anyone. What? Why did he tell them not to tell anyone? You'd think he'd be saying, spread the word, the Messiah has come. Instead, Jesus tells them, shh, keep it to yourself. Some of the scholars call this the messianic secret. Here's possibly one of the reasons. Although the disciples had started to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, they didn't really know what a Messiah was. The Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming, the Messiah's coming. Hold on a minute. What's a Messiah? Now, according to some of the Jewish rabbis at the time, this is how the Messiah thing was supposed to work out. The world would get worse and worse, spiraling down into a moral and spiritual vacuum. And when things could get no worse, God would send Elijah to prepare the way of the Messiah. And then, when God's Messiah arrived, he would be a great warrior king with political clout and military might who would physically crush his foes. He would unite the people in a great Armageddon battle against whoever opposed God's people. And finally, he would take his throne in Jerusalem and rule Israel in peace and prosperity. It would be just like the good old days when David was king, but better. You can't blame the disciples for wanting that kind of Messiah. The Romans had occupied the country. Pagan ideas and culture were corrupting the people. Even the high priest was little more than a puppet in the control of a pagan power. And the time was ripe for a heroic warrior messiah to come and conquer the Romans and take his place on the throne of David. But that was not the sort of messiah that Jesus claimed to be. If people, especially the people closest to him, thought he was that sort of Messiah, it could spell disaster. Tell them that the holy conqueror prophesied from ancient times had come, and they might go and form an army and try and draft him as supreme commander. Hundreds of thousands could die, and Jesus' true mission would never be revealed. So Jesus explains to his disciples God's plan for the Messiah puts it this way. The Messiah must go through great suffering. Even the elders and religious authorities will reject him. He will be killed and in three days rise again. This was, of course, a contradiction to everything the disciples expected. God's anointed king suffering and dying 
No way, Hosea. That was blasphemy to suggest that God would allow pagan Gentiles to torture, mistreat, and even kill God's all-powerful Messiah was just wrong. And so Peter rebuked Jesus. He doesn't suggest that Jesus was mistaken. Peter rebukes Jesus. Now anyone growing up in a traditional Jewish society would be horrified to observe Peter taking such a tone with his teacher. Disciples did not go around rebuking their teachers. And how does Jesus react? Strongly. He calls Peter a mouthpiece of Satan. He wants Peter to know that yes, he was the Messiah, and good on you Peter for recognising that. But Jesus was not going to be the sort of Messiah Peter had been expecting. The true Messiah's mission involved suffering and death and resurrection. And Peter was making a devilish suggestion in telling Jesus that oh, he had no need to go to the cross. No cross, no redemption, no forgiveness, no death being conquered, no resurrection necessary. Maybe Peter's problem was that he defined victory in human terms, not in God's terms. Jesus then gives them God's definition of victory. If any want to be my followers, let them take up a cross and follow me. Take up a cross? Only thieves and criminals took up a cross. The Bible even said, cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. What could Jesus mean? He continues, for those who seek to save their life will lose it. And yet those who lose their life for me and the gospel will save it. This contradicted logic. If you want to save your life, you should fight and even kill to preserve it. But here's Jesus saying the way to life is through death. For what do you gain if you gain the whole world and lose your life? This was turning everything upside down. It would take the disciples a long time to come to terms with this. And the same applies to us. We are no more enlightened than they were. True life, says Jesus, isn't found in human achievement or personal gain. Neither is it found in political or military power. Jesus suggests it is found instead in spiritual power, in relationships with each other and with God, in worship and in service and abandonment to the will of God. Sometimes question why we belong to a church, but I'd suggest that one of the reasons we involve our lives in the church is because we are people who really want to live and we really want the best out of life for ourselves and for our families and for our friends. It could even be that, like Peter, we've recognised that Jesus is special, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the Living God, but maybe we're not exactly sure what that means or how we should go about telling others. And though we believe that Jesus can give eternal life, not just life in heaven after death, but abundant life in the here and now, these words about the cost of following him, they seem difficult and troublesome. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must take up 
a cross. Because if you try to hold on to life, you lose it. But if you surrender your life for me and the gospel, you'll have true life. After all, what good is it to gain the whole world and never really live? In a painkiller culture, trying to understand where suffering fits in with God's will is a tough cookie. And Jesus challenges us to turn our thinking upside down through his miracles and works of healing, through his compassion for the crowds and for individuals. It's clear God takes no delight in human suffering. Mother Teresa, that great missionary to the poor in India, used to instruct her novices to truly love is to fight against evil. And you can't fight without receiving blows. You can't help the suffering without suffering yourself. In our materialistic, pain-fearing world, People love to hear the voice of the miraculous Jesus. Witness the success of those who preach a gospel of instant prosperity or ceaseless blessing. People are not so sure they want to hear the word of the cross. What sort of Messiah would call us to such a thing? The idea is no less shocking now as it was then. But, listen, just as God's Messiah was not the sort of Messiah that people expected, maybe abundant life is not about all the things people often think it is. Maybe the good life is not being materially well off or even comfortable. Maybe abundant living does not depend on being in good health or even on good terms with everyone. So let us, we who confess him as Lord in the early years of the 21st century, ask ourselves what sort of Messiah? The sort that tells us anything goes and we're not to worry about our sins or our neighbours or about injustice or poverty, but simply accept blessing after blessing from his hand. One who says, don't worry, be happy, live forever and ever in a pain-free, trouble-free world. Or are we going to hear the voice of one who explained his mission to his disciples in terms that involved undeserved suffering a cross, a resurrection, and a promise of the empowering presence of his Holy Spirit to all who would come after him. Who spoke about picking up on the pain and the shame and the rejection of others and placing it on our shoulders to help them carry it up a hill towards forgiveness. One who saw prayer as an opening up of ourselves to God's will, rather than as an exercise to persuade God to do things our way. One who spoke of putting our self-interest aside, dying to ourselves and being prepared to live and die for one another. Do we want to hear the radical voice of a revolutionary Jesus? Or do we want a panacea Messiah to solve all the world's problems and tell us we don't have to get our hands dirty because it's going to be all right in the end? I read the Gospels and I am challenged to believe that God's desire for this world is that it be a place of miracles and blessing, and healing, and hope. But I'm also challenged to see that love is not wishful thinking. Love is not just an emotion. That sometimes it's a weapon. 
to destroy all that cheapens and lessens and takes away life. And to enter the fight means not sitting back and letting God take care of everything, but actively wielding that weapon of love, which may mean putting ourselves in situations that can only be travelled through with faith, and whose only hope is in the ability of God to turn hopeless situations like crosses into places that sing with the joy of resurrection emptied tombs. What sort of Messiah? There's only one. His name is Jesus. All the others are simply pretenders and charlatans. And the way to life is found in his call to service. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. May God help us by God's Holy Spirit to truly be disciples in Jesus' name. Amen. to give. Take up a cross and follow. We hear the talk of abundant life and blessing, and our hearts say, that sounds like just what I need. But then we hear the demands and fear that we are already drowning in a sea of commitments, and that it's all we can do to get through the day without taking on anything else. As always, Lord, we look at things through our limited view, not from the eternal perspective. We are consumed with tasks that create no long-term benefits, taken up by so many wants that we fail to recognize our real needs. Holy Spirit, break through that mist of unknowing and fear that causes us to stumble in our walk of faith. Remind us that your yoke is easy, and whatever you call us to, you will enable us to carry. Remind us that we cannot always walk by the clear, cool waters, but also must travel through the valleys of shadows. Remind us that whether on the mountaintops or in the caves, your presence is still right there. We continue to lift up before you those for whom life is hard, those in sickness or recovering from injury, those who have faced bereavement, those seeking freedom from that which is taking away their joy, those struggling in their relationships, troubled by debt, those for whom life is simply hard at this present time. We offer you these concerns. We pray for Yvonne's brother Paul as he recovers from heart surgery in Liverpool. We raise up others who are recovering from surgery and hospital stays, Robbie, Peachy, Diane and Anna. 
And we pray for those who grieve this day, the friends and family of James, Mark, and Amy. We offer prayers for support for those who lost loved ones and those who rose to the challenge in response to the national emergency of September 11th, 20 years ago. Those who worked rescue and recovery only to contract illness from the environment of that occasion. We are reminded of the scripture in John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We continue to lift up before you the nations of this world, including this land, with its great variety and opportunity. We pray for our elected leaders at national, statewide, and local level. We pray for those who lead your church in her variety of traditions and callings. We pray for peace in our world and in our time, thinking of all those who are displaced from their homes through violent conflict, Every age brings unique challenges, and in every age, your people have responded through service and proclamation of the good news that Jesus Christ died, that we may be forgiven, and was raised that we may live our lives in his strength. In Jesus' name, that we continue to pray, using the words he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. into the world and share that love that God has placed in your heart. Let the world be a more lovely place. And now go in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and let the people say Amen. <laughs>